Matthew eleven twenty eight. When you're there, say amen. 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 I didn't hear what you said. Was... Matthew eleven twenty eight. Hallelujah. I just got through reading this. Huh? I just got through reading this. Well, the Lord might have already gave you my message. You might want to be up here. <laughs> yeah, I'll move on over. He need to be standing up there. I believe that. I'll move on over make room for you, brother. I'll, I'll listen. <laughs> it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to talk to you about that yoke that he talks about. See, so it all sounds good. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. And he will give you rest compared to what this world offers for you. Because there's no rest in this world. You'll find no kind of satisfaction. But the Lord says, my yoke is light. Which means you still have things to go through. The Bible talks over and over about trials that we have to face. And we're given example after example of different trials that you have to go through in the Bible. So you're not home free whenever you come to the Lord. A lot of people come in and think, well, I gave my life to the Lord. It's all a bed of roses from here. I got news for you. You're wrong. Okay. It's just really starting whenever you come to the Lord. Right. See, there's a difference. Here, we have to walk through fire on earth. The people that don't live for the Lord, you look at them and sometimes it seems like they have it so much easier than what we do. But the thing is, we walk through fire here on earth so that we don't have eternal fire. Amen. Their fire will never be quenched where they're going. They'll never be able to get out of what they're going to. And I would much rather walk through fire here on earth than to spend eternity in a fire that I can never get out of. Right. And worse Amen. than that, Amen. in a place where I can't feel God's love, where I am eternally separated from the Master and love to never be able to feel love again. That would be the, one of the most horrible things. So we got to face things here on earth to avoid that. The Bible talks about it all through there. And it talks about a goad that has to be refined. And it talks about tribulations. In 1 Peter 1 and 7 it says, That the trial of your faith, much more precious than goad, through trod with fire, might be found unto praise and honor of the appearance of Jesus Christ. That tells me I have got to go through trials. And I'm going to go through it until I face Jesus one way or another. Either when he returns or whenever I go to the grave and I raise back up to meet him. One of the two ways I have trials in front of me. And the Acts 14 and 22 at the end of it, it says, Through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Through much tribulation. God doesn't leave you without warning that you're not going to go through things. He tells you over and over, you're going to face this. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So he makes it obvious we have got to go through things. And trials, we might not understand that they're actually a blessing to us. They really are. And you can't really talk about trial and tribulation without talking about Job. Oh, I love Job. Whenever I think I got it bad, I go read about that poor man. And I think, my Lord, I got it pretty good. Because see, Job... He, he was an upright man, perfect before the Lord. Not meaning that he was perfect altogether, that he didn't sin. But he was perfect in the Lord's eyes because he went after the Lord. He had a heart for the Lord. He didn't just worry about his own salvation. It says that he would go and sacrifice for his kids in case they had sinned as well. So this was an upright man and he had a lot of wealth and he was in high regards in high religious standards. People went to him for advice and things. This was a well sought after man back in those days. And he had it pretty easy at that point in time, according to the Bible, because he had a hedge about him. But one day, Satan went to the Lord, and they got to talking, and the Lord started talking about Job. He's like, but have you seen Job? Because the Lord seen something special in Job that he didn't see in some of the others. He's like, consider my servant Job. So Satan's like, but he, he does, does he serve you for nothing? Look at this hedge that you got about him because you serve him. And God will keep a hedge about you when you serve him. But he said, if, if you lower it down, I can make him turn on you. And sometimes the Lord will let that hedge come down. And it's really a blessing. 
Satan's trying to make you turn on God, but it's not meant to break you. But a trial can make or break you whenever you go through it. So one day, Job's out there and everything seems fine. And here comes one of his servants running along to him saying, Master, guess what? Your ox was out there in the field and your asses was out there and the Sabines come down and they slew all of your servants and took your animals. And while he was yet speaking, and I might mess this up a little bit because I ain't got it in front of me, so I, I, I'll be paraphrasing. But while he was speaking, another one comes around and interrupting him. Master, guess what? Your camels were taken. There was three bands of Chaldeans that came along and took the camels and they slew all the servants and I'm the only one that was left to come and tell you about it. And yet another one comes running while that one's talking to say, Master, guess what? There was fire that fell down out of heaven and it killed all your sheep and all your cattle and all your servants except for me. And here comes one of the worst ones, the last one that came while that one was yet talking. Master, all of your children were in one house in their elder brother's house they were drinking and eating, having a good old time, and here come a wind and blew the house down, and all of his kids died in one whack. All this, we think we got some trials and stuff going on, before one storm was over, another one was hitting him. I, I couldn't even imagine to begin what he was thinking to go all through that. I mean, you're losing your wealth because the animals and stuff, that was your wealth back then. You're you losing all your servants all in one day. All this going on within a matter of minutes, probably, because it was interrupting. And then all of your children, to lose one person that's close to you is hard. And you have a hard time dealing with it. But to lose all of them in one way, that would be extremely difficult to deal with. And then when that was going on, you would think it would get bad enough. But see, the Lord had spared his help. He said, don't touch his, his body and all this. But Satan goes back to him and but the Lord says, see, Job didn't turn on me. And he says, but give me his body. All that a man hath will he give for his help. And the Lord granted that. He said, go ahead, but you can't take his life. So Satan goes and strikes him with these big bulls from head to toe. I couldn't imagine being covered in something like that. I mean, sore. They, they talked like he was absolutely unrecognizable. His friends, when they come and see him, did not know who he was. So here he's done lost everything. He has all this physical stuff going on. He's mentally down. He's physically down. And his helpmate, the person that's supposed to lift him up, says, won't you just go ahead and curse God and die? Could you imagine someone that's supposed to be there for you? Just curse God and die. Get it over with. There ain't no need to go on no more. But Job still didn't give up. He says, you speak as a foolish woman. He wouldn't give up. And then he goes out to grieve, as they did back then, their morning rituals. He shaved off his head and all this, and he went out there and sat down. Here comes three of his friends to comfort him, supposedly. And they come, and they sit in silence for seven days and nights, nobody saying a word. Finally, Job opened his mouth and started to talk. And instead of his friends being there, they turn around and look at him and say, You've sinned that's caused this. They didn't help Job out. They was adding on to the trial. The man's already lost everything. Has his wife turned against him. His health's going downhill. He don't know what's going on. And here's some people saying, it's your fault that you're going through this to begin with. So the trials just keep on coming to him. He just keeps on getting hit after hit after hit. And he maintains, no, I've not done nothing. And he curses the day that he was born. Oh, that I've never been born. That my mother's womb had never been opened. But in all this time, he never cursed God. Not one time. Not once. He remained strong in the Lord. And as a matter of fact, in, let's see, Job 23 and 8, it says, Behold, I go forward. But he is not there, and backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on my right hand, that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Oh, I like that right there. Job said, I don't know what God's doing. I can't find him. I pray. I fasted. I read. I couldn't find him on the left. I couldn't find him on the right. I went forward. He wasn't there. I looked behind me. God is nowhere to be found. But I know. He knew something. He knew what his faith was. He knew who his God was. He said, I can't perceive what God is doing. But I know he's here. He's all around me. I just can't figure out where he is. And I don't know what's going on. 
But when it's over, hallelujah, I'm going to come forth like gold. I'm going to shine in the midst of all this. And that's what the trials is about. It's shining in the midst of all of it. We don't know what God's doing sometimes. We don't understand. We don't have to understand what He is doing. We don't know what God knows. His mind and His thinking is way beyond ours. We cannot perceive what God is doing. But we got to know it's going to be okay in the end. We're going to come forth shining as gold. Whenever they want to purify gold and refine it, they melt it down in a big old pot. And all the impurities come to the top. That way they can just scoop it up. That's what God does to us while we're here on earth. He just melts us down so that all their impurities come to the top so that He can just scoop them on out of us because He's getting us ready to meet Him. And we can't have a spot or a blemish. And He knows what we need in our lives when we don't. That's why we go through trials and stuff. That's why we have it. And because we pray things, we might not understand what we do when we pray certain things, but sometimes we pray, Lord, I want to be closer to you. I want to be stronger. I want a bigger anointing. I want to go out and help people. But see, you can't go out and help people until you get some stuff out of your life and until you learn how to overcome things. God can't use somebody that's all shaky whenever stuff happens. They have to learn to be strong. They have to learn how to have patience and stuff. So we have to go through trials. We have to be melted down to get all the sin out of our life so that we can go out and help others. And so whenever you say, Lord, I want a closer walk with you, he's going to teach you how to have a closer walk with him. But he's going to teach it. He's not just going to give it. He could give it. He could come down and sit next to you and start talking in the spirit and stuff if that's what he wanted to do. But you know that I was saying, give a man a fish for a day, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he's going to eat for life. God's going to teach us how to fish so that we can eat for life, so that we can keep going through this stuff. And we got to have them trials. Or rain, as it says in sometimes. And with rain, rain comes down and it gives the earth moisture and stuff. It makes the ground soft so that you can break it open and plant seeds inside of it. So we have to go through things so that our heart can be softened. So God can plant in us what he wants to be there. And whenever this grows, it's going to grow up into a big tree. And our branches are going to spread out over our brothers and sisters and over the lost people so that we can bring them in. We're going to help to be the shelter and stuff. Oh, but there's more to it. You have the first rain to soften it, but it's not over. A tree keeps growing, and it has to have more and more rain in order to grow so that it'll be ready. So you're not done just because you get through one trial. And I tell people all the time, I have a lot of people call me and talk to me about stuff. And they're like, man, I just wish this trial was over. I can't handle no more. And I tell them, get used to it. Be calm and just have fun with this one because the next demon is going to be a little bit harder than this one. So just enjoy where you're at right now. Get comfortable and learn what's going on. Don't be in such a rush to get to the next one. Because that's what it is. It's new levels of anointing, new demons and stuff. You're going to go from one fire into another. But the last I knew, Jesus was still walking around in that fire, just like he was with Meshach, or, I can't talk. Shadrach, <laughs> yes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he's still in that fire. He appeared then, and he's still walking around with us today in that fire, okay. through all of our trials and stuff. I remember one time, it ain't been, well, it's been a while now since I had it. The Lord deals with me a lot in dreams. I, I get a lot of dreams, and... I remember at plain as day, I was dreaming. I was sitting in my home church in the front pew where I always sit. And the pastor walked back there, and he turned and looked me dead in the eyes, and he said, the Lord's about to do a work in your life. Oh, I got excited. Talking about somebody waking up with a joy. I woke up with joy, a little bit of spring in my step. The Lord's about to do something. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, it went on a few months later. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose in my life. And I'm like, Lord, what just happened? He said, I'm doing the work I told y'all I was going to do. I said, oh, my Lord, here we go. <laughs> and yep. I, I went through that, and I, I whined, and I complained for a bit. And then I realized this ain't doing me no good, because as long as I sit here whining and complaining, I'm going to be stuck in this same spot. I might as well get up and start on walking and just deal with what's going on. And just whenever I think I would get to a place where I was going to get a breakthrough, here come another storm hit. And the Lord's like, hold on, I'm teaching you. Just hold on a little bit longer. See, the Lord, whenever he's going to do something, it, it normally comes in a trial, a test. It, it normally isn't too pretty of a package that we see that he sends to us. 
I remember one time I was going through something and um, my heart, it was just completely broken, the thing I was going through. I mean, I was completely devastated and we're there, prayer lines going on and people shouting all around me and I'm just sitting there, Lord God, help me please. I can't even feel you right now. I was so broken. So he sends a person to me and they said, Lord said, he's going to heal your broken heart if you'll accept it. I thought, well, that's a crazy question. Yeah, I'll accept it. Come on, heal my heart, Lord. Well, it wasn't a week later. I'm like, Lord, you're killing me. My heart has been ripped out. And I, I have a real relationship with the Lord. I just talked to him like I would someone else. I'm like, what are you doing? You told me you was going to heal my heart. It feels like it's being cut out, put on the floor and stomped on and broken into pieces. And the Lord's like, I told you, I'm going to heal a broken heart. See, what I, I couldn't grasp was that every time the Lord gets ready to do something, I normally get broken first. Just like in Jeremiah 18, the Lord told Jeremiah, he said, go down to the potter's house and I'm going to give you a word. So Jeremiah goes down and he watched the potter put the stuff onto the little machine and start making his pot. But it was messed up. So he crushed it back down and started remaking it again. See, that's what the Lord does sometimes. He crushes us back down because we're made into a pot that has a bit of a crack in it somewhere. There's something that can get in or something that can seep out and that ain't going to work. So he has to push us on back down and put us back on the wheel. And it's not too fun going through all that stuff. It hurts to be fixed and to be squashed down and all that. You feel a lot of pressure. You feel a lot of demand during all these times. But it's all for a blessing. The Lord will not send a trial or a test or allow one to take place unless He's going to send you a blessing right after. The blessing is in the making. But a lot of people, they get lost along the way. They, they lose sight. I would like to say all the battles end within a couple months, but I've been in battles that took years for me to see some results to it. That's just the truth of it. And I ain't trying to dishearten anybody. I'm just telling you. Sometimes it takes years, but there's still a blessing at the end of the road. You just got to hold on, and you got to get ready for it. Amen. See, whenever all these things was going on in my life, and I felt like my world was ripping apart, and I'm sitting there, one second I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? And I'm basically bawling the Lord out. Lord, forgive me, but there ain't no need to lie about it. I was angry at, at some point in time at God. I got angry, and I got very depressed here and all this. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I finally come to the part where I started bringing the word in. And that's what it takes. Because whenever I'm down, I like to put songs on. I put it on YouTube and I listen to it. I just listen to it, read it to me. And I'll sleep with that on just to listen to those words and get it in me. And at some point in time, you got to have that word in you so that whenever that stuff's going on, it starts to come back out. And then I got to the point I could say, Lord, I'm hurting. This is not good. I, I don't like what's going on, but I trust you. I know what you said. All things work to the good for those that love you. Many are the trials of the saints, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. That means everything that you go through, he's going to deliver it. And see, whenever I was down, these words started coming to me. It started bringing life into me. In the middle of my valley and stuff, I learned how to be happy. At one point in time, I started to crave the battle. Because I knew what was going to happen whenever I entered into a battle. I was going to enter into a new anointing right after that battle. That's what I knew. I had to pay a bit of a price, but I got something out of it. And I started hungering for the battles. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be in something that's over my head because I don't want to go down if it ain't meant for me. But Lord, if I'm able to handle it, send it on because I'm ready to go on with you. I want to go to the next level. I want to be closer to you. And that's what it takes to get there is them battles. But you got to stay strong in it. You got to fast. You got to pray. You got to have that word inside of you. Because whenever you're down, sometimes it gets hard to comprehend what you read. But the Holy Ghost will speak to your heart and he'll bring back what you've already read. And it'll start lifting you up out of the valley that you're in. That's what it talks about, the lily in the valley. Jesus is that lily. And whenever you remember those words, it starts to refresh you. And it starts to break them chains off of you, even though they're heavy. Even though all hell's going on around you, you've got demon after demon coming after you. You can still find peace in that trial. And you know, okay, this is a good thing, Lord. What do I need to learn from this? You always got to ask yourself, 
what do I need to take out of this, Lord? Let's work on that. Stop looking at the problem so much, saying this is too big for me. Just say, Lord, what do we need to work on learning so that we can get out of this one and go on to the next one? Because the Lord will bring you up out of any trial that you go through. But the trials are necessary. We can't be without the trials. We've got to have them. Oh, Lord, I praise you. I'm going into Proverbs 3 now. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and the long life and peace they shall add on to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablets of your heart. Right there, that's telling you. Keep that close to you. Keep it in your heart for just these such things. And then it goes on to say, So thou shalt find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. He'll help you understand this stuff. If you keep the words down in him, in the middle of that trial when everything is just topsy-turvy, he'll remind you, this is what I'm doing with you. I'm doing this great work in you if you keep a hold of him during that. It says, trust in the Lord with thy heart and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. So that right there tells me I don't have to get it. I don't have to understand what God's going to do. And I tell people all the time, I quit trying to guess what God is doing. Because just as sure as I think God's going to do it this way, I already know what he promised and he's going to go this way and make it happen. He makes an idiot out of me, I just tell you. He does it a complete opposite way of what I think he's going to do. I guess he likes to show me I can't put him in a box because he got his own unique way of doing it. But the thing is, it's a way that man wouldn't think of so man can't get glory for the things he does. And God is wonderful like that. He's all the time doing things to surprise us in ugly packages. Most of the time, though, that, that's the problem. We can't get past the, the way that the gift is wrapped. It's all messy and nasty and stuff. And a lot of people fall at that. A lot of people don't want his gift because of the way that he chooses to wrap it. But you got to know that trials and tests is only for a season. Everything that we're going through, sometimes it feels like we're never going to get out of what we're going through. But it says, this too shall pass. Mm. And I love that verse. And I love the words, and then. Oh, how I love them words. There was bills on the table that couldn't be paid. And then God come through and done it. My sister, my brother, aunt, mother, whoever was lost on drugs. It looks like we was going to lose them. And then God stepped in and he delivered them from it. Hallelujah. It looked as if we were going under. And then God came through. It looked like depression was taking them down. And then God brought cheer. Hallelujah. And then. That is some of my favorite passage in the Bible. Two little words you wouldn't think as much. But oh how I love them. Because when it looks like the end of everything. And then God does something. Hallelujah. And I love when God steps onto the scene and does that. And then. I wait for that moment, hallelujah, because I know at the end of every single trial that I'm going through, at the time I least expect it, when I think I'm going under, that's when I get, and then, and then God comes through, and then I get that higher anointing that I've been seeking after, and then I get to see lost people come into the kingdom of God, then I get to see people that has been hot in talents get up behind the pulpit and have the courage to do what it takes, and then. Oh, what wonderful God we have that he works on us, that he gives us these trials and tests, that he loves us enough to push us on through. Because sometimes there's weak love, and we see a lot of that in the world right now. They love people, but they love them to death because they try to protect them. But God wants to strengthen us, so he pushes us <coughs> on out. Just like a little eagle, it talks in the Bible all the time about eagles and stuff. Well, a mama eagle takes the baby way up on the highest cliff and nudges it on off and lets it almost hit the ground. But, and then they step in and save that baby eagle. That's what God does to us so that he can teach us to fly like the eagle flies. Because see, once you get to the point of an eagle, you soar above every storm that you go through. Amen. I hope you're not too long, brother. Hey. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. That's a good one.